my pleasure to be here today. Um, especially given it's a beautiful day. Thanks for taking the time out to be here. And I really want to thank the organizing committee uh, for providing me with this opportunity to speak on a topic that I am quite passionate about, both as a researcher and as a daughter of aging parents whom I'm really close to. So the title of my presentation is Healthy Body for a Healthy Mind, slightly different than what's advertised, but the, the, the main idea is the same. So as many of you are probably aware, um, cognitive impairment and dementia is a significant issue, both at a society level and both at the individual family healthcare level. And currently, it's, it's estimated that worldwide there's one individual being diagnosed with dementia every four seconds. And based on current projections, we will, we will expect that the number of individuals with dementia will only exponentially increase over the next 20 years. And unfortunately, there is actually no effective drug therapy to either prevent or treat dementia currently. Okay. Now, against this fairly bleak uh, sort of background, there is hope. Okay. So first of all, there is also the positive observation that not everyone um, who age age um, with impairment. Okay. So there is a lot of individual variability in how people age cognitively, and you and you among yourselves probably have observed this. You have either friends or family members who really are quote unquote still very much with it in their 90s, 80s, etc. And we have observed this through research as well, where we track people over time. And this is a graph just sort of demonstrating that um, pattern whereby each line actually represents a individual over time. So we track individual, let's say, when they're first at 65 years old, and we look at how they function cognitively over time. So what I just want to really highlight here, so if you look at this graph, overall there's a black cloud that's showing a downward trajectory, meaning that that at an overall level, individuals are showing some cognitive decline um, as they age. But as well, there are some individuals who are actually showing improvement. Do you see that? So these, these are the red lines. So some people are actually maintaining as they age, while others are actually showing some improvement. So what I'm trying to highlight is that there's a lot of individual variability, and so we really wonder, is significant cognitive decline inevitable with aging? And the answer seems to be no. And in, in addition, with advanced neuroimaging, we're also now realizing that individuals could actually have a lot of what we call neuropathology. So if we scan their brains, we can actually see the typical hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, such as um, plaques or tang tangles, with, again, very advanced neuroimaging that's not available, per se, clinically, but is available to us as researchers. Yet, they actually are functioning really, really well on a daily basis. So again, lots of hope. And what we are now real realizing most importantly is that the brain as an organ is actually plastic throughout the lifespan, meaning that it actually can respond to the experiences or stimulus that you uh, expose to it even as you age. And that's very similar to, let's say, how your muscles may respond really positively if you decide to start lifting weights twice a week every day or every week, whereby you would expect your muscles to get stronger, um, and a little bit bulkier. Now with the brain, we're realizing, again, in older adults, it can still change in how it responds to the environment. So with that sort of context, so first of all, that the number of cases with dementia will only increase, and yet there's the observation that potentially significant decline is not always an absolute with aging. There's been a lot of interest in how lifestyle behavior could be, um, could, could be um, or, or their potential in preventing dementia. So among the potential lifestyle strategies, there is nutrition, there is sleep, so how much sleep, how well do you sleep, um, how cognitively challenging, or, or how are you challenging yourself cognitively, so how much education have you acquired throughout your lifespan, and as you age, are you engaged in intellectual um, activities? Do you socialize? So do you have a core group of individuals in which you have uh, constant socialization and interaction, but then of course there's also this activity, which I would argue is the forerunner in, in terms of its potential as a strategy for preventing dementia. And so what I'd like to do today really is to share with all of you some of the key and really I think important and um, exciting findings that really suggest that exercise is medicine and that um, as a population strategy, exercise probably is the most promising approach in terms of preventing dementia. 
So just to provide a bit of guidance as to how I'll go through um, the talk today, I will first really talk about the research we have that really looks at the relationship between exercise and cognitive function and I also briefly talk about some of the potential mechanisms or how does exercise promote cognition. Then what I'll do is end with two studies to really highlight what is the relevance uh, in terms of the research I presented in terms of um, healthy aging. And before I go into the different studies, I just want to highlight really within the context of research, at least in humans, there's two major types of studies that we, we conduct to really look at the relationship between um, exercise and cognition. One is called a cohort study, and these are studies whereby we recruit or we um, get a, lots of people, literally thousands. We assess you so we can look at how well you can move, how well do you think, how well can you remember, and every year we will reassess you. We don't intervene or give you a, or give you a particular treatment or prescription. We just basically see how do you do over time. That's called the cohort study, and they describe relationships, and again, no prescribed treatment or intervention. As compared with randomized controlled trials, which again, do look at relationships, so you are still looking at exercise and cognitive function, but in these particular studies, what we do is recruit individuals, and we actually assign them a specific intervention. And the reason we do this is that it gives us a little bit more confidence as to the cause and effect of exercise on cognition. Because as you could imagine, within the context of this particular study, and we say, well, people who are really physically active in 2010 were functioning much better cognitively in 2020, you could say those individuals who were very physically active could have been more genetically inclined to be more fit or to age well. While within a randomized controlled trial, because people actually don't have a choice as to which intervention they're given, there is a little bit um, of more robustness or causation um, related to the findings. So the first study I really want to highlight is a cohort study, and it was a large cohort study. It was a study actually done uh, back in the 2000s and published in 2004, and it's what I call the oldie but very good one, okay? So it involved approximately 18,000 women, and they were followed for up to 15 years. So again, these individuals were tested and retested over a 15 year span. And not surprisingly, what the investigators or research found was that those who had higher levels of physical activity had less, less risk of cognitive decline. Okay, and I'm sure none of you um, are surprised with that particular finding. But the reason that I like to sh talk about this study is more the sort of subtitles or sub-findings. So first of all, what they also found was that the benefits of phys physical activity wasn't restricted to those with the highest level, okay? So one of my key points today with my take home message is that when we're talking about the benefits of this activity in terms of promoting um, healthy cognitive aging, we're not talking about high levels of this activity where you have to go out buy a gym, gym membership, invest you know, $200 in workout gear, and really invest, let's say, two and a half hours per day on exercise. We're really talking about very manageable doses of exercise that what I call is very khaki friendly. You can wear your cotton pants, cotton shorts, put on your golf shirt, and it, you can still participate in the, at the, lo the level of activity we're really talking about to be beneficial. So what did they find here? So first of all, like I said, the benefits weren't restricted to those in the highest level. In fact, they found that for those individuals who walked at least one and a half hours per week at a pace of 21 to 30 minutes per mile, also had neuroprotection, okay? So that's lots of numbers and I know it's after lunch. So what does that actually mean? Well, 1.5 hours per week, so let's take the minimum dose, that actually works out to be just 13 minutes a day. Who likes coffee here? <laughs> okay. Who, 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 who lives close by, let's say, a coffee shop with their apartment or house. How long does it take you to walk to your coffee shop, your favorite coffee shop? One and a half minutes. One and a half minutes, okay. Anyone else? That's really close. Didn't expect that. <laughs> wow. For myself, who live, who live literally at UBC, not, not really, but I live there because I work there so much. Um, by the time I get my coffee and back, it's approximately 15 minutes, really. And so what I want to flag is that 
in terms of the amount of time they found to be beneficial is quite manageable, I would, I would argue. And then now let's look at the pace. Is it talking about sprinting for 13 minutes or running for 13 minutes? Well, let's break this down. So this was a US um, paper, so they weren't using the metric system, although they were all supposed to convert. That was the agreement that they didn't. Um, so if we talk about 21 to 30 minutes per mile, that was the pace they found to be sort of at which you had to work at. That's actually equivalent to walking uh, four times around a standard track in 21 to 30 minutes. Okay, and so if you can follow my math, so if we take your actual amount of time that you need to walk and the, and the pace in which you need to walk, it actually works out to be the title there, which is walking twice around a standard track in 15 minutes can be neuroprotective. And again, my key message is that this is very manageable doses, and the beautiful thing is that this type of finding has been replicated in later studies. And again, in research, we always look for replication. Might sound really boring, but replication really provides us with confidence that the findings may be true. Okay, so now I'd like to move to randomized controlled trials. Again, just as a reminder, these are uh, studies whereby participants come in and we basically randomize by flip of a coin, essentially, as to what type of intervention or type of exercise they will participate in. And this, again, is to allow us to really look at um, sort of the causation path or the, the relationship between exercise and cognition. And within the context of exercise training, there's two broad types, although I really do acknowledge exercise is much broader than this, but just for sort of today's talk, very broadly, exercise could be divided into aerobic training, which is anything you do to try to increase your heart rate or your fitness level, so walking, running, swimming, cycling, and resistance training, which is any type of exercise you do to try to increase your muscle strength, power, or bulk. And so first of all, what do we know about the effects of aerobic exercise on cognitive function? So when I say cognitive function, I'm really talking about how do people perform. So we might give them a memory test and see how well they can remember the list of words, list of numbers, how quickly they, make, they can make a decision based on a very specific situation to provide them, as well as brain function and brain structure. And brain function and brain structure are, are typically um, assessed through Again, neuroimaging, either um, MRI or CT or some other type of um, neuroimaging technique. Now, within the literature or within the research, in terms of cognition, as you guys may um, appreciate, there's lots of different uh, sort of types of cognition. So as you, as you can even appreciate, you could, you could say, for example, you have really good memory, but in a specific type. So, for example, for myself, I'm really good at remembering what I need to do for my kids and for my work. But I can't remember to this day my driver's license number or my visa number. My husband, on the other hand, he has forgotten our son at the soccer pitch, <laughs> completely forgotten about him, until an hour and a half later when I phoned him and said, do you have Jamie? He's like, oh, no, I don't. But this man can remember my driver's license my visa, not just this year, but even the one that has expired now, etc. <laughs> so I want to flag in terms of cognition is very multi-domain or multifaceted. And within research, we have typically focused on two domains, executive functions, which are your cognitive abilities that really allow you to function independently within society because it's a set of um, thinking abilities related to planning, decision making, multitasking, Okay, it's very sensitive to aging effects and certainly is um, impaired in both Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, the two most common types of dementia worldwide. 